Oh, there we go. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to This Week in the Clinic with me, Josh Catalis. And today I have a very special guest, which we'll get to in a moment. I'm Josh Catalis, clinical nutritionist and functional medicine specialist. And for those of you who are meeting me for the first time on video or on the internet, uh, I uh, run a practice here in Toronto. I work with people live and I work with people all over the world. And I also run a functional nutrition certification program. And we've started this segment this week in the clinic where I bring you the lessons that I learned in the clinic during the week um, and throughout the year. And I bring them to you so that you can use them in your life to really take control of your health. So today, we have a very special guest. Today. Do you always caress your guests? Only the special ones. <laughs> Only the special ones. Right. Megan Telpner. The infamous Megan Telpner. Author. We're not going to go in order of importance here, just so you know. Author of two best-selling books, I'm Diet and the Undy Cookbook, which recently won the gold medal by Taste Canada, the best cookbook in Canada in this category. Yes. That's pretty amazing. Very exciting. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. And, and it wasn't the only cookbook in that category. It wasn't, no, it wasn't the only cookbook in that category. And we're going to be really diving into a little bit about her early years in this journey and kind of how it led her to going down the health path and we're going to be diving deep into cure. How to cure the incurable and what cure actually means. So welcome Megan. Thank you for having me. Yeah. This is like, I'm here. This is where the magic happens. The healing happens. It is, it is. And I'm just queuing up here. So if you guys want to um, make comments as we're chatting here, we will be answering questions and we will be interacting with you guys. I have my computer just in front of me here. So feel free to pop us, pop up a, a comment or a question and we'll, we'll address it. And also on Facebook, it's really cool. You know, typically when you like a post, you click like once, but when you're watching Facebook live, you can like it as many times as you want. Yeah. So when you give us the thumbs up or the heart or something, we know that you're liking what we're talking about and you can just, uh, we know you're out there and we'll continue talking about what's going on. Yeah. So we're going to talk about cure today. Yes. Did they ever mention that word cure when you were going through your journey? They did. Can you give us, before we go there, can you give us a super quick um, summary. summary of what went on? Yeah. So what went on was that in 2003, after four years of university where I was probably definitely not eating an optimal diet um, under a lot of stress. Wait, diet has something to do with this? Well, it depends who you ask. Okay. Right. Well, we're going to ask just just some small journals called The Lancet, <laughs> the British Medical Journal, the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, and a couple others a little bit later on. And maybe we'll, we can also ask the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation of... We will um, be asking the Crohn's and Colitis yeah. Foundation of Canada as and well. And America. Big thing. Yeah. So, yeah. So, after four years of university, um, a summer where I did an intensive bike journey and then I got uh, five vaccinations in one day. Mm -hmm. I headed off to Africa to travel and almost about, almost exactly seven days after I got my vaccines, I developed a very high fever um, and then gastro symptoms followed. Mm -hmm. So it was sort of a culmination. You know, there's never one trigger to chronic disease or autoimmune. It's usually a, a gathering of of incidences and experiences and factors that create a perfect storm for right. disease to proliferate in the body. Is that what you know or is that your guess? Uh, this is what I know. Okay. So it's not just one single bug, one single food? No. Never. Because they're spending a lot of money on research to look for that one single thing. Exactly. Okay. We can talk about some of that okay. ridiculous research. Okay. Um, not that I'm being judgmental, <laughs> but you said, you always say it's not judgment when it's based on facts. Right. <laughs> so I spent three months in Africa dealing with bouts of various gastro symptoms, um, serious diarrhea, constipation, um, anxiety, you know, cause we know that there's, I now know that gut brain axis when one thing is in distress, mm. it affects sort of the whole nervous system and mm. vice versa. And then back in um, back in Canada, when I got back, I started. What, a are, you, what are you talking about? Oh, this is that? the second brain. Yes. So back in Canada, <laughs> I started a per 
parade of doctors. Three years, 19 doctors later, after being told it was stress, it was IBS, it was hormones, it was um, psychosomatic, right. it was infectious disease, mm -hmm. tropical disease, uh, I was diagnosed with the autoimmune, autoimmune inflammatory bowel disease of Crohn's. Right. Was told that, here's where the word cure comes up, I was told there wasn't one. There wasn't a cure. That I was going to be living with the, the symptoms of this disease for life. Mm -hmm. And it was purely a, 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 a experiment, I will say, in finding the right combination of medications to suppress the symptoms in the hopes that I wouldn't have to go through surgery. Right. So this was in the summer of 2006. Having fortunately parents that believe very firmly that we need to be our own health advocates, they pushed me to explore alternative options, mm -hmm. which included acupuncture as a primary acupuncture, treatment. Acupuncture, interesting. So yeah. I started acupuncture, uh, daily meditation, daily yoga. I eliminated every possible food that, and I started doing all my own research because there wasn't any. So I'd look at foods that could promote inflammation in the gut. Mm -hmm. And anything that could potentially exacerbate what I was experiencing, I eliminated. Mm -hmm. Very simple. And right. it wasn't like, I wasn't on like an extreme paleo or ketogenic or SCD diet right. or any of these trending diets. It was just whole unprocessed hmm. foods, no gluten, no dairy, no sugar, no alcohol, no caffeine. Wait, no gluten? There wasn't that much even research. Well, maybe there was some original <laughs> research on gluten back then. There was a little bit. What there wasn't was a lot of options for mm -hmm. gluten-free eating. Like restaurants were out, most right. packaged foods were out. Like there was definitely not the the bounty and abundance we had yeah. 10 years later. And so I did that, was going for acupuncture, doing all those things. And within a few weeks almost, I started to feel better. Mm -hmm. Within a month, the key Crohn's symptoms, which is you know heavy evacuation, bloody diarrhea, mucus, all those cute, delicious things. I was gone, mm -hmm. and after three months of this like healing protocol, um, I was 100% symptom free. That was a decade ago. Wait, 100% symptom free 10 years ago? That's right. Okay, at that point, I'd like to just bring up a couple things here. Um, I did a search on the internet. Have you oh. heard of this place? <laughs> I, I do use it. Specifically, Google. And I typed in, is there a cure for Crohn's? Or can Crohn's be cured? And the first thing that popped up was something from the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation of Canada, uh, where I have spoken before. We can maybe talk about that later. Where, by the way, when you did speak, mm -hmm. you signed me up under a different name. Yes, we did sign you up under a different name, just so we can get you in, just in case you're on the blacklist. I am on the blacklist. Okay, so this was their answer. And I quote, can Crohn's be cured? There is no cure for Crohn's disease yet. Crohn's and Colitis, Crohn's and Colitis Canada funds medical research. I think they're coming to get us. I think they're coming to get us inside. Okay, they've passed. Um, Crohn's and Colitis Canada funds medical research in Crohn's disease, and with the help of our generous donors and partners, we will eliminate these diseases. Right. Please donate now and join us in our mission to cure Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis and improve the lives of children and adults living with these chronic diseases. So. The first part of their answer is there's no cure for Crohn's disease. Correct. Okay? Yeah. I'm just going to, we can maybe go back to what else they said in their answer a little bit later on. I really want to go back to what they said about their supporters. Okay. We'll go back in one moment. <laughs> okay. I, I need you to hold your tongue. <laughs> hold it tight. Um, and then I went on to Google. I went back onto Google. Have you heard of this place? Yes. Okay. And I looked up what the definition of cure is. Yes. And um, cure is relieve a person or an animal of the symptoms of a disease or condition. And then they give us an example of a sentence. He was cured of the disease. Okay? Yes. So at this point, would you feel that you're cured? I do. Based on the definition in the dictionary? Yes. Okay. But the Crohn's and Clyde's Foundation says there's no cure yet. Yes. Okay. Um... Now, one of the things that I, I also yeah. should want to say, because uh -huh. I know that there are a lot of people, a lot of people, especially in Canada, Canada is one of the highest concentrations of people with inflammatory bowel disease that believe there is no cure, that have experienced not having a cure. And so a cure by that definition uh -huh. might look different for different people. Right. Um, 
my experience with the cure is that 10 years without medical intervention, no signs or symptoms of the disease. Uh -huh. um, but anyway, we're going to get into it because I want to, yeah. I want to make sure we clarify the difference between healing and curing. Yeah. Yeah. They are different. Yeah. And I think what, what's actually happened in terms of the use of the word cure in the medical system is it's been pulled from antiquity, from many years ago when they started to really develop uh, medical sciences. And a lot of it had to do with germs, Yeah. right? So people would get a germ, um, like the influenza virus, and what would happen is, well, maybe not for the influenza virus, but for certain, you know, bacteria or, you know, uh, diseases or whatever, and they'd eradicate that, they'd kill it, the immune system would fight it or something, and they'd be cured. Right. Right? But now what we're dealing with is this complex, um, this complex tapestry of degenerative diseases that happen over a period of time and that are multifactorial. Yeah. And maybe what we're realizing here is that the word cure might not be so appropriate. Right. And you used a word, what was your word? Healing. Healing, Healing. was very interesting. So, um, I actually pulled this recently from a, a talk by Dr. Thomas O'Brien, and I really liked what he was talking yeah. about when he was talking about cure. And he was saying that his definition of cure is that three things, okay? Mm -hmm. No more symptoms. Yep. Okay? No markers that the disease is present. Yes. So maybe in inflammatory bowel disease, we're talking about um, inflammatory markers like C-reactive protein, for example. And a cure also shows that someone could do whatever they want and the disease won't come back. Yes. So under that definition, yeah. I still believe that I have been cured mm -hmm. because I have no symptoms. If I were to be tested, if I were to go to a brand new doctor today and they ran all of their tests, mm -hmm. there would be no signs or symptoms of the disease. There mm -hmm. would be no markers. Mm -hmm. um, there might be scar tissue potentially in my, in my intestines. Mm -hmm. Um, but that can happen if someone has a serious infection as well, or serious leaky gut, right. or diverticulitis. So there could be other things that could cause that. But the third thing, and this is what's so important, I think this is why, I don't want to say I got lucky, but why I've been able to sustain a remission, or sustain the healing, which is that I do do whatever I want, but what I want to do has changed. Mm. So if I went back to... Can you say that again? I do whatever I want, but what I do, what I want to do has changed. It's evolved. It's beautiful. So if I went back to waking up at four in the morning to go work out with a personal trainer too hard and then spent 12 hours at a job I hated and then came home and had like a microwave dinner while watching TV and did it all over again the next day without any joy, without any calm, without any nourishment in my life. There's a good chance this disease or some variation of it would return because I do have the genetic predisposition. Mm -hmm. You know, genetic diseases tell us our weaknesses, mm -hmm. and that's the the you know you talk a lot about this in your courses right. about epigenetics about how the way we live will will decide what switches get turned on and off that it's right, not a right. life sentence. So through my healing in learning how to meditate, learning how to exhale, learning how to find that space and calm and be less reactive to mm -hmm. life mm -hmm. and learning how to effectively nourish my body and understand what it needs and, and fulfilling that to find that balance and doing work that I love and being in relationships that I love and omitting the things that are stressful or obligatory or the things that are unnecessary in living a simpler life, mm -hmm. which is what I choose to do, I've sustained health and not just sustained it, but built ongoing and we still have our health challenges you know things come up i get a cold i get a flu for sure for sure but um i no longer have the fear of that disease coming back and if the disease comes back i don't consider myself having just been in remission for 10 years to me it's a new manifestation of that disease and it's a sign that something else is out of balance in my life that needs correcting mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. love it so um, one of the things that Dr. Thomas O'Brien goes on to talk about is that he de defines remission as no more symptoms and no more markers, but you can't do whatever you want. Right. So I mean, I'd say you're in a type of remission. It's, you know, it's all semantics. It is. But again, going back to the definition in the dictionary, cure is no symptoms. Yes. Yes. It's true. 
So another thing that I looked up, we're going to... We're gonna you know what I think is yeah. interesting? I just want to point this out because with cancers, mm -hmm. typically they say five years... Um, with your five years cancer-free, you've been cured. Right. Or you are a survivor. Right. But they don't have that same definition with the autoimmune disease. Mm -hmm. that That's super interesting. And I think, again, that gives people a false sense of security. That word cure, it's almost thrown around in a way that's irresponsible. Because that five years, it's like, oh, I've now had my five-year anniversary. Let's go out and party and go back to all my ways. Yeah. But what they don't tell people is that when cancer happens in one part of the body, it's actually a problem of the whole system. Yeah. The immune system doesn't just happen in one part of the body, it's everywhere. Yeah, it's effectively a breakdown yeah. of your body's ability to it's the weakest heal and link. repair itself. It's the weakest link. Yeah, it's like end stage of inflammation, end stage of immune breakdown, end stage of whatever it may be. Yeah. Um, and I recently wrote an article about uh, breast cancer research and where the, mm. the funds go. And there's now studies saying that anywhere from 70 to 90% of cancers are preventable with diet and lifestyle modifications. And one of the biggest challenges we have isn't even the food we're choosing every day, but the chemicals that we're surrounded by in our environments, which is part of with autoimmune. Like I said, that it's never that one thing, that there's so much we're exposed to mm -hmm. that contributes to it, which makes the food we eat, supplements we choose to take, the health of our home and you know how we furnish it, right. our cleaning products, our personal care products, makes those things that much more fundamentally important. Right. Organic food. Yeah. Like so if we can reduce the chemicals where where we're able, do the daily detox stuff, which you've been talking a lot about on your weekly show, mm -hmm. it's so important for prevention, for healing, and for sustaining ongoing remission. The biggest mistake people make is they think, and, and I, you know, I've been bullied out of many a Crohn's and colitis group on <laughs> Facebook. You know many. you? I have a problem with, <laughs> a, like, when I see people... Wait, I'm going to stop you for a moment. <sighs> Can I stop you yeah. for a moment? Because uh, I want to just try to stay on, on track here for a moment. But one thing you said is, that, is the connection between chemicals and autoimmune disease. Yes. I just want to mention that I did a, a talk at a conference earlier this year on that connection. Yeah. And how important it is to detox, to get the toxins out. Um, we're talking a lot about it these days. I've got a course coming up in February, February, uh, sorry, January 5th. It's our first course of the year on detox and biotransformation. Um, and it, there's a very strong connection there. It's, it's talked about in quite detail in the book, The Autoimmune Epidemic, uh, which is a fantastic read. Yeah. What I was going to say <laughs> was about getting bullied out of these groups yeah. because it, it hurts my soul that people continue to suffer needlessly due to misguidance and misdirection and dismissal from the medical community and from organizations that are there intended with the guise of supporting people who are suffering and then posting things like that of little hope. And if you actually go but into there's the, no care. There's no care. If you go into the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, and you download their dietary recommendations, there's a girl in a hospital gown pouring syrup on a stack of white pancakes. That's beautiful. And even when they, they posted an article about their ho holiday health guide, so one of their recommendations was to avoid high fat foods, so instead recommended a lean brisket or low fat eggnog. Mm. And under that understanding of health, they're correct. There is no cure. Mm -hmm. But they're looking at one set of tools and one right, toolbox. Right, right? If we right. go beyond that and look at a total lifestyle, emotional, physical, spiritual, and then also recognize that healing is going to be different for everybody. That mm -hmm. Some people may be asymptomatic. Say that one again. Healing is different for everybody. Love that. So, yeah. so what that means is that healing and how that looks and how that feels and how that manifests in different people is going to be different. So not everyone will be asymptomatic, but you may find that you slowly start to develop more calm in your life, or you mm -hmm. develop better ways of responding to cravings, mm -hmm. or better ways of processing stress in the body. Mm -hmm. And so you may still have flare-ups um, of any kind of autoimmune disease, but then you also gain the empowerment to know what your body needs so that it doesn't get to the extreme 
um, or that you know how to prevent them so they happen less frequently. So even if you've gone a medical route and opted for medications, which are important and that can save lives, so don't think that you know you need to be the hero, right. but that despite what the medical community might say, there is also integrative approaches with diets and supplements that can mitigate any health effects, negative health effects True. of the medications, yeah. also to help prepare you or help you to heal from surgeries. So it can all work together and we will all Definitely. have our own experience. But if we let go of the idea that I'm searching for this cure and instead search for health, then we re recognize that maybe 7-Up isn't the best option when you're having a flare-up. Or that maybe Jell-O isn't the best option. Or that maybe Abbott Laboratories Ensure product made of hydrogenated oils, which happens to be part of what you said earlier, one of the supporters of the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. So all of their supporters are basically profiting off the diseases. Yeah. Um, then you can start to find a different path forward where you may not be 100% better, but you can reduce your suffering. Yeah. Thank you for that. <laughs> okay, what we're going to do is... I'm a, only a little bit passionate about yeah, this yeah, yeah. topic. You, you said a couple really great things that are going to segue into what we're going to chat about next. But first, I want to just check in here online and see if there's any comments that um, I'd like to address here. Um, the link above for the functional nutrition isn't working for me. Okay, thank you, Catherine, for posting that link. It's there now in the comments if any of you want to learn more about my program. Uh, someone says, great definition breakdown, Megan, from Derek. Thanks, Derek. Yeah. Um, so glad I could join again, says Sandra Schellenberg. She's Thank back you, for Sandra. more. So many C and E's in the house. Uh, from it. Karen White. When you stated, Megan, uh, did you have it said in your mind that you were going to heal or cure your symptoms, or were you just seeing what would happen? That's a great question. So when I got my diagnosis from my gastroenterologist in the summer of 2006, he basically said, you're not sick enough yet for, for intervention. Come back in six months and we'll see where you're at. He had said to me, diet has no effect. I told him I was thinking about acupuncture. He said, there's no research to support. And I looked at this man who was very disheveled. Did you say diet has no effect? He yes, said that. Yes. We're going to talk about that next. He said that he, and he was like very heavy, looked did not look well, was not the picture of health. And I'm grateful for that because it made me question how much he actually knew about what healthy living was. So when I went this route, I had absolutely no idea it would, if it would work. And more than that, I was terrified that it wouldn't because then I would look like a fool. I would look like um, whatever, it would, you know, my ego and my pride were involved at that point. Um, but at the very, Worst, like the worst case scenario was that what I was doing was at least the very least going to put me in a better position if I had to undergo surgery uh, of, of better recovery and better outcome. So I looked at it as an insurance policy. It was an expensive insurance policy. I, I had to take a leave of absence. I couldn't work. So mm. it was a costly thing. It took three months of time plus the costs of acupuncture um, and the foods and all these things, but, and, and I've gotten criticism for this in, mm -hmm. in media mm -hmm. for like, oh, how lucky she got to take that time off. Right. But the fact is that I took three months off once and have never, I don't even need to knock wood, have never taken a day off work or a day off of life because of this disease since then. And so that investment, that insurance policy in that period, um, like the the return on that investment is right. infinite. You spent a little time then to have a lot of time. A lot the of rest time of now. And like when I look at you know seeing my students, the graduates of the Academy of Culinary Nutrition joining in, like that's part of the return. Like now they're out there Amazing. doing it, which Amazing. is so cool. I love so it. I didn't have the intention of healing. I just wanted to feel better. That I just wanted to feel better. It was that simple. I just didn't want to be sick. You're creating a beautiful ripple. <laughs> Love the ripple. This one's it's like great. a wave. Okay, so Josh I wanted. Josh isn't joining in on my wave. I wanted. I want to dive. <laughs> I want to dive into a few things here. Um, actually, I just had a question from I think it was uh, Karen. Katie asked if I do distance consulting, and yes, I do. You can contact our clinic. But 
Um, I just wanted to um, dive in here. We, we, we've touched on diet a few times. Yeah. Again, if I go to most Crohn's and colitis websites, um, particularly the one, the Canadian one here, they say there's no one diet for everyone. There's been no standardized diet, yeah. which is actually true. Very true. It's true. But they also don't talk about things that might exacerbate the condition. So, um, you know, one of the things that I say is not knowing the right thing doesn't necessarily mean we don't know the wrong things. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, and what are the wrong things? Well, what, what I, oh. what do you want to say? Honey? I want to say something. I want to say, um, there's actually a link at the top of this to my post about healing Crohn's because it's so multifaceted. Mm -hmm. There is no one approach and my approach will not work for everyone. But one of my challenges with how they phrase things, but how there is no known diet that cures standardized, standardized diet that cures any disease is absolutely accurate, but that doesn't equal diet has no effect. That's a great segue. Thank you. And they're turning the tide slightly. They're, yes, they're they are. They're starting it to is, embrace it's, it. It's very slow, but we also have to appreciate that a lot of what we find in the research to put it into clinical practice takes about 17 years to put 17 that. 17 years. So you started your journey 10 years ago. Yeah. You went gluten-free. No one even had heard what gluten-free was, but you took a, a bit of a leap of yeah. faith. They're just now making probiotics, mm -hmm. like standard, mm -hmm. standard Absolutely. recommendations. Yeah. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was that, oh, I Great, that gives me a chance to talk about a few studies here. So what I said is that there's a lot... I remember. Go ahead. I was just going to say that though there isn't a standardized diet, there's like one basic thing I think we can agree on. Processed food is not going to build health in the body. So if you just get rid of processed food, like that's a huge step forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that segue, <laughs> Megan. And I just wanted to bring forth tongue, some research. Please hold your tongue for a moment. Some research that was done talking about uh, what actually predisposes or increases the risk of someone to get inflammatory bowel disease. And you know, one thing we can learn from this, of course, we're focusing on Crohn's and colitis inflammatory bowel disease here because we're chatting with Megan today. But a lot of these lessons apply to all sorts of diseases and conditions that people have been told there's no cure for. Now sometimes legitimately there's no cure, um, but we have to look at it in a bit more detail here. So um, there was this, you know, Megan was just mentioning processed food. We sometimes call that the SAD diet, which stands for? <laughs> the diet that makes your cells weep. <laughs> The, the standard Megan's Megan's now my emoticon and my my live emoticon. <laughs> the standard American diet. Um, in the Lancet in July of 1985, they talked about a connection between people who consume the standard American diet and at a higher risk of inflammatory bowel disease. Okay, so there's some really good information, and I'm just going actually in order of year, but there was one before that in 1979 in the British Medical Journal, and these are not small journals, these are journals that all the medical professionals read, that formula feeding actually increases the risk of inflammatory bowel disease. Who ate formula? Me. Megan, Megan did. In the American uh, Journal of Clinical Nutrition in 1996, there was uh, some research, research that showed when people consumed refined sugar, also known as sucrose, they had an increased risk of inflammatory bowel disease. And when they looked at the subjects, the people who had inflammatory bowel disease were eating about two times as much refined yeah. sugar. I have a horrible fear about this because those studies are old. And some people, this isn't my fear though, some people are like, oh, we'll find us some new research. But research done legitimately shouldn't change. My fear, though, is that these are studies that were done before genetically modified foods were introduced into the food supply. So now, in 2016, 2017, when you're buying conventional formula, uh -huh. conventional foods with sugar in North America, it's different in other countries, but in North America, you're getting you know, soy oil from genetically modified sources. You're getting sugar from sugar beets that are genetically modified. So my concern is that... But, the, but Megan, 
there's no research that genetically modified foods. Oh wait, there is. A book by Dr. Jeffrey yeah. Smith is loaded with research on genetically modified yes, foods. Yes, if you want a shorter thing to read, I also have a post called uh, How to Have a Conversation About GMOs that's incredibly well referenced. There's also a documentary that goes with this book, but it's a little long. <laughs> so read my post, it'll take you 15 minutes. But anyway, so my, my fear, like that we keep seeing this increasing rise in autoimmune disease, um, and these are studies based on the 70s, in the 70s mm -hmm. and 80s. We went up to the 90s. I had two more. Okay. Two more in the 2000s, mm -hmm. Journal of Gastroenterology and Hepatology in 2003, that wheat and dairy allergies are linked to inflammatory bowel disease. Right. And finally, Best Practices and Research of Clinical Gastroenterology in 2006 said that reduced intake of omega-3s, which are the anti-inflammatory fatty acids, associated with higher risk of inflammatory bowel disease. So you know what's interesting is a few years ago there was a study, and because I don't have the Josh brain, I have the Megan brain, I can't remember mm -hmm. where it was published, but I know it was cited through the Crohn's and Plitus Foundation about dietary research um, into specific nutrients that could potentially help heal inflammatory bowel disease. So one of the things they were testing was vitamin E, mm -hmm. but they were testing it through the consumption of barley which contains oh. gluten. And the other thing they were testing was the benefit of probiotics, but they were giving it in yogurt, which is dairy, which could also potentially cause all a those, problem. All those dollars. So it was like they were so close. I know, I've seen that before. And then just like, just didn't go yeah. far enough yeah. to get an actual result. It's so unfortunate. Yeah, like okay. what I would love to see is a study where people eliminate gluten, eliminate dairy, eliminate processed sugar, and then take in vitamin E and probiotics and vitamin A right, and Like a multifactorial. Exactly. The unfortunate thing about that is that it's, impossible. it's not done because in science we like black and white. We need to know the exact variable yeah. that has had the greatest yeah. impact. And the other thing that is also very difficult to study is the psycho-spiritual impact where you could have two people, identical twins, mm -hmm. eating the exact same diet, the exact same protocol, yeah. But how they process stress will completely differentiate how they accept or how their body might respond to a physical treatment. And that psycho-spiritual variable is virtually impossible to, to track effectively. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And regarding some of the research where... Did you just pull up research right there? Yeah, I had it really quick. Um, <laughs> in, the, in the journal Aging in 2014, there was um, a, a study published, this is a little bit off topic, but by this doctor, deals with a lot of people with de neurodegenerative diseases. Yeah. And what he showed was that he looked at 35 about different factors. Mm -hmm. So he's thinking outside the box. He's doing personalized medicine and he's trying to normalize about 35 different things, making sure they exercise, improving their blood sugar levels, making sure hemoglobin A1C is in a good place, using these botanicals, et cetera, et cetera. So this guy's thinking outside the box. It's, it was an amazing piece of work. But I want to move on here and just present one more study here. Since okay. we were talking about diet, and then we can look at some comments, some more comments. And yeah, then we I, can, I have one more thing. And then we can let Megan say her one more thing. Just one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just have one. Okay. It's on topic. Okay, so this was in 1993. Um, this was in The Lancet. Have you ever heard of The Lancet? Oh, that old thing. In November issue. And what they did was they took two groups of people. One group they put on steroids and one group they put... These were people with inflammatory bowel disease. One group they put on steroids, which is one of the treatments people get. Very strong, very effective at bringing down inflammation. And the other... But a lot of side effects. The other group they put on an exclusion diet. Hmm. So they, they eliminate a whole bunch of foods that might be exacerbating their symptoms. And what did they find? Well, after six months, um, the group that were on the steroids were at, at about a 34% remission rate. Okay. The group who was on the exclusion diet had about a 70% remission rate. Uh-huh. So more than double. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So that's after six months. What about two years or two years follow up? Okay, because we know people tend to get worse and maybe can't maintain it for a while. So yeah, both groups did get a little bit worse. Um, after two years, the group on steroids was at a 21% remission rate. Yeah. And the group on the diet, the exclusion diet, 38%. So steroids, probably one of the strongest drugs for bringing down inflammation. Uh, half the effectiveness of an exclusion diet. If that exclusion diet was a drug, it'd be a blockbuster hit. Right. So, thank you for that segue. <laughs> <laughs> Analogies are not my thing, they're yours, but I'm going to try this out because we talk about how there's so much funds being raised and so much research because this is such an epidemic. But I feel a bit like, let's pretend we were in a big parking lot at nighttime mm -hmm. and you lost your keys somewhere in this parking lot. Mm -hmm. You're more inclined, this is before iPhones when you had a flashlight on it, but you're more inclined to go look under street lamps that are in that parking lot oh. where there's like an area lit up. Uh -huh. So I feel like the funding and the focus is only on these areas that are being lit up under the street light, but the actual place where these keys are hidden are in some dark corner or maybe they broke off the keychain and there's different keys hidden in all these different corners but there's no light on them and so the mainstream world where all this funding is going and research is being done and truly I believe the best intentions are just not finding those right keys that are mm -hmm. needed to unlock so true. the secrets. And what we're trying to do is bring some light into those dark places. Oh! oh. Had to throw that in there. Okay, so let's, we're, what we're going to do, we're going to move to the comments. Yes. We're going to do a little bit of a summary of what we spoke about today. And then we're going to yeah. sign off. Yes, let's see some good questions. So give us, give us some hearts or thumbs up if you guys are, are digging this. Or just share so, it. Just so we know. Share, share it, it for those people you know who think we're nut jobs. Okay. You think we're riding the crazy train? Um, so, care. Uh, first of all, I'm gonna start with Katie here. Katie, how's it going? Katie's always hanging out. Hi, Katie. Um, along for the day where this kind of information will be included in the standard nursing, nutrition, and medical curriculum. For now, I'm so grateful to people like you and many, many other wonderful resources out there that have supported my own learning over the years. Well, you're most welcome. You're most thank welcome. Thank you for your, your feedback. And we appreciate everything that you're doing to help get this information out there and all the learning you're doing in the service you're providing by what you know. Okay, a um, couple more. We're going to try to keep answers to these short. Okay, so this one is for you. What were <laughs> Was that a warning? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what were your biggest challenges you faced with family and friends? <laughs> when you decided to change your whole lifestyle to what you practice today and how did you overcome them? That's one for Sandra. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a challenge. I'm grateful that um, I had the support of my immediate family, my parents, my brother. Um, I no longer am friends with some of the people that I grew up with that I would have hoped had supported me, but you kind of learn. Um, and, and my feeling was that if people cannot accept the choices I have made for my life to live optimally and healthfully and happily, then I do not need them in my life. And though it's like a death, that kind of breakup or severing of a relationship, um, and it's still hard, there's still those challenges with some of my relatives, uh, but I truly believe that family is a feeling. And same with friends, like it's hard, I miss people, but as we grow older we also evolve and at some point if relationships are no longer serving us and that the people we are surrounding ourselves with are not um, in support of us serving our higher self or higher purpose they no longer have a purpose in our lives and it's very hard when it's relatives um, but what we've come to do and what Josh and I have been blessed to be able to do together um, is that we've cultivated and we're grateful we both have wonderful relationships with our immediate family we've also been able to cultivate new friendships and relationships with people who are into what we're into that are high vibe that get it that respect what we're doing we respect what they're doing we may not agree on everything but having a certain level of express of, of respect is vitally important and ultimately if someone cannot support you wanting to live as healthfully as you can assuming you're not doing it in a judgmental way where you're imposing it on anyone else 
um, then they know may no longer have that serve that purpose in your life. Great. Is that short enough? That was great. Thank you, okay. Megan. Uh, this one comes from Karen White. Uh, now that I am learning all this information, it's almost like I want to do everything at once, exclamation yes. mark times three. <laughs> I'm not able to work right now and it's so and it's so so and it's so expensive. Um, how do you not become crazy when you have no choice or not have anything organic or not GMO? How do you not become crazy? So I'm gonna just start with this one. And I'm just gonna say that you do as much as you can. You know, uh, one of the greatest uh, benefits and the greatest challenges today is that there's so much information out there. So you think like, you know, there's podcasts and there's these videos and there's just so much coming at you that what I always say is that no matter how many books I read, no matter how many biochemical pathways I learn, conferences I go to, uh, people I listen to, podcasts I listen to, it always comes down to the fundamentals. And most of the fundamentals don't cost a penny. Yeah. Making sure you get good sleep, making sure you do stress management, stress processing, um, making sure you're drinking lots of good clean water. When it comes to food, you, there, you know, there's a hierarchy. You can concentrate on the clean 15 and stay away from the dirty dozen. You can find out what that is at Environmental Working Group. Um, and, um, you know, getting sunlight, you know, so things like that, you can make a huge amount of progress just starting with those things. That's what I was going to say. Some of the most important things we can do are completely free or under 20 bucks. Like get a skin brush, dry skin brush once a day mm. as a simple detox. Um, go outside and Josh said get sunshine, but just even in the winter, go outside, get some nature, uh, get some fresh air, get sleep is so important. So turn off that technology and go to sleep. Um, if it is within your means, get a water purification system so you're drinking clean water. So there are, and make your own own home care products, your own cleaning products. Those are, it doesn't get any cheaper than baking soda and vinegar and lemon. So there's so much that doesn't have to cost a lot. And then, like Josh said, you do what you can with the rest. And you do it in, in, in stages. And what you find often is that your priorities shift. So, you know you start to change what you value. And so maybe some of your monthly food or coffee or restaurant budget goes towards things that are more health supportive. So maybe instead of going out to yoga classes, you get a membership where it's like $15, $20 a month. You can do all the yoga meditation you want at home. So there's different ways you can start to um, reprioritize things to make, make opportunity more available. Yeah, and it's a journey. It's all about finding what works for you. Not everyone can take time off completely from life. You know, I work with a lot of new mothers who maybe have some adrenal fatigue or thyroid issues and they can't abandon their child. They still have to work within that framework, which could be quite stressful. So we work with that and you all have to kind of start where you are. Okay. And you don't have to do everything at once. Is that it? We're going to wrap things up here. It's time. So Megan, should we just keep shaking? Yeah. You know, you know those awkward long shakes that people do sometimes, yeah. you know? So, Megan, um, okay. do you, <laughs> um, anything coming up that people might be interested in? Are you writing any new books? Are you, um, I don't know, yes. you're, you're always up to something. All of the above. No, uh, coming up in our next big thing in January, actually nothing to do with any of this, but everything to do with it is our Biz Rocking Insider program. So if you go over to megantelner.com, you'll see a banner, sign up for the free webinar on January 10th. And why does business have to do with health, Josh? What does that have to do with it? Health, wealth, and happiness. Health, wealth, and happiness. If you can find passion in the work that you're doing, whether it's starting your own business or in your current career, finding that spark of passion and excitement and creativity is fundamentally important for your health. And I've been very blessed to have a successful business and so I want to share how I've been able to cultivate and keep that passion going for almost nine years. Mm -hmm. um, so that's coming up in January. We'll also be launching our fundraising cookbook with the Academy of Culinary Nutrition in February from scratch. Uh, recipes from my students. They're amazing. So scratch isn't a student you had and it's like all of It's not just recipes. from scratch. It's from scratch. And then if you're interested in learning more about culinary nutrition, we have registration opening in the spring and you can learn more about the school and the academy at culinarynutrition.com.
Cookbook.com. And of course, everyone should be buying their friends and family the End Diet Cookbook because then it's you guaranteed. You mean that? Well, that won the gold medal recently? Guaranteed when they invite you for dinner, you'll be able to eat the food. It's the gift that keeps on giving back to you. Awesome. And it's currently on sale too on Amazon. I think it's like fifteen dollars in the U.S., seventeen dollars in Canada. That's a bargain. That is a bargain. Yeah, especially knowing how much work it was. <laughs> <laughs> I always say it's like crazy how much is in a book and how, and the price of that. Yeah. Like the, based on what's in books are the original crowdfunding. Wow, opening cans of worms right in the last few sentences here. <laughs> so we spoke about uh, just a little bit of a summary. We talked about what cure is. We talked about Megan as a case study, and we talked about what you can do. Now, um, one of the things we did, we spoke about today was autoimmune and toxins. And on the topic, I have a course coming up in January. It starts in January 5th. It's, so good. It's the first course of my new group for the, my functional nutrition cer certification program. And it's also a standalone. So we're going to talk about how to properly clean up your environment and your life. And we're going to get a little bit into the nitty gritty and science of how detoxification Josh, works. Josh, can I just sign up? Can I just sign up for a juice cleanse in the new year, and that'll take care of all my detoxes? We're going to talk about why juice cleanses might not be the best and only way to detox. This is such a good course because many of you I know did culinary nutrition, have done holistic or integrative or natural nutrition. There's nothing on detoxification out there like this. And not like this. It is, in my opinion the most important aspect of daily prevention care and even disease care, any condition. A first integrative approach, functional medicine approach, is to detoxify the body so that the systems of the body can start working. So it is like, it's a great one for the first of January, the first one in January to start yeah, and get yeah. going. It's, it's yeah. so important for health. Mm -hmm. I see uh, Libby just joined. You're a bit late, Livy. Too late. <laughs> you snoozed and lose. <laughs> um, okay, or you can catch me just at joshgatalis.com if you're interested in any anything else having to do with me or what I do. Um, my consulting, my courses, my program. You can check me out at joshgatalis.com. And since Josh isn't as blatant marketing as I am, I'm going to ask you to please share this. <laughs> please share yeah, it with please your friends it. and followers and your audience because... Uh, hopefully, uh, some of the information we shared will um, trigger some people, maybe not trigger, inspire some people to recognize that there are things they can be doing today to enhance their well-being, their quality of life, uh, help them to heal and or prevent future challenges with their health. Great message. Yeah. So we're going to be running this uh, little episode thing uh, in the coming weeks as well on Fridays at 10.30, same time. We will be taking one week off for the holidays, so have fun and celebrate. And we will be picking up in January again with this week in the clinic. And we also have a special guest early in the year, which I'm super excited to to uh, to have here. Um, but I want to thank you all for joining me. Have an awesome holiday and a happy new year. And I hope to see you all again very soon. Bye, everybody. Oh, he's doing it. I'm doing it.